Hello, I'm Ash Quigley, and this is the Take Back Your Mind series, the place where we hear real stories from insightful and inspiring individuals about how they've reclaimed their minds and now live life to its fullest. In these conversations, you'll hear from people across many different walks of life that share what it means to be human and how they navigate their inner and outer worlds with a little more ease and intention. And today we'll be joined by Dr. Jodie Richardson, who's one of Australia's leading lights in managing anxiety and amplifying well-being. She supports parents and teachers to understand anxiety, to change their relationship to it, dial it right down and lighting the way for others to do the very same. Not only is Jodie an international speaker, the best-selling author of Anxious Kids and Anxious Moms, a well-being consultant, creator and host of the podcast, Well Hello Anxiety. She's also a respected media commentator in the well-being and parenting space, both here in Australia and beyond. We are so excited to have Jodie here today and get into this very insightful chat. So here we go. So welcome Jody. It is such a pleasure that you can be here and be part of this Take Back Your Mind series. And with the theme being exactly what it is, I like to start off by asking our guests to start with a bit of a check-in. So if we were to say on a scale of one to ten, where one is being flat, unmotivated, tired, ten is feeling really energized, motivated, in flow, where would you say you are sitting today? I thank you, first of all, uh, for inviting me to be a part of your campaign. I would say today I'm, I'm around an, an eight. Uh, I'm really, um, it's been a great morning and uh, I'm excited to be here with you. So I'm feeling really energised. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I have spent a lot of time listening to you, following you. Um, I have heard a lot about your story already, but for those who may not know so much about you, would love to know a little more if you could share about your journey, how you got to this point and maybe what were some of the pivotal moments along the way? Oh, yes. It's uh, in hindsight, isn't it? So often that we can look back and reflect on our mental health journey with a, a more clarity than we have when we're actually going through it. I can look back now and see that I started having symptoms of anxiety when I was four and it's a uh, 44 years later, and I still have symptoms of anxiety. I live with an anxiety disorder, but I actually like to say that I thrive with it because I've learned a lot of skills uh, along the way and I put in a lot of uh, time into managing it. And uh, when I was four, I started having the classic symptom of having an upset tummy. And I was in a stressful classroom environment uh, with a large number, a double class of preps, and I would say to my mum, I don't want to go to school. I feel sick. But of course, I didn't look sick. I didn't have a fever. I wasn't vomiting. And so thankfully, off to school every day I went because when we don't feel good with anxiety, we feel it in our body. We want to do whatever it takes to stop feeling that way. And often that can lead to missing out on a lot in life. And especially school, when we don't go to school, it can be a really big problem for families and for children. Fast forward about 20 years, I experienced clinical depression. So I guess we're talking about pivotal moments. Um, my anxiety was undiagnosed. My teachers and my parents didn't know I had anxiety. My mum didn't know she had anxiety. When I was in my mid-20s, there was a, a death in my husband's family, which was a real trigger for me, I suppose, in terms of my own mental health. And I started to decline in terms of my mood and sense of hope. And I ended up being diagnosed with clinical depression. And uh, upon getting treatment, I, I took myself to the GP. I knew that there was something wrong. And when she said to me, I know what's wrong. I know what's happening with you and I know what we can do about it. It was just such a great sense of relief to, for, for what I was experiencing to be understood. And eventually through lots of therapy, it was identified that I really did have an undiagnosed anxiety disorder. And that can sometimes lead to a clinical depressive episode, not always. Um, so that was a real pivotal moment because that was a point at which I'm like, was able to start to make sense of so many experiences in that sort of last 20 years. And 
I left my professional role as a, a secondary teacher and went to work for Beyond Blue because really it was a turning point for me in terms of, right, we all need to understand more about mental health and we need to know what we can actually do about it. And so I fast forward to now, I created my business, which is just in my name. And I really pride myself on my work uh, speaking to schools and corporations, to students, parents, teachers, writing and podcasting about anxiety in particular, but mental health and well-being and what we can do because there's so much we can do. Wow, 20 years to get a diagnosis. What, what was that like living with anxiety all those years without having a name for it or, you know, having a label? It was, it's interesting because when you, you just think that that's what life is like for everyone else, you think that, well, on reflection, I worried all the time. I sought so much reassurance. I just had this terrible chronic worry that would come with me everywhere I went every single day. And I guess I didn't have the sense of mind to be able to kind of observe what was happening with me in my own thinking. I was just in my thinking. I was always looking from my thoughts. Nobody ever knew to teach me to, to start to look at what I was thinking and to ask appropriate questions about what I was thinking. Whereas I really just believed everything I thought was a fact, that the catastrophic thoughts that I was having would come true if I didn't ask somebody to tell me otherwise. I was diagnosed with asthma. Uh, when I was playing a lot of high level netball, I would get very anxious, I'm very competitive. And I was playing with a lot of older women. I was 16 and playing with mums who were very experienced players. And I had a lot of pressure that I would put on myself. And my anxiety was diagnosed as asthma. And I think I managed it by really working very, very hard, uh, definitely a perfectionistic streak and doing everything I could to control the outcomes as much as possible. And so it's interesting living with a mental illness and not knowing you've got one and just thinking that that's life. And I think when I first experienced depression, I could recognise something was wrong and was motivated, obviously, to seek help. And it was quite intriguing to start to work with my amazing psychologist and to unpick kind of the seams of what had been woven through my life up to that point and make sense of so much of it, almost all of it um, made sense. So what I love now is that people are just so much more aware. There's so much that you can do to help somebody on their whole life trajectory, simply with an understanding that they're going through something and then getting them the right help. So yeah, it's been a journey. Mm, and one that I definitely resonate with I know in my own experience I I definitely have been challenged with anxiety pretty much the majority of my life but it was actually when I was in uni and was in a, a bathroom actually and on the back of the door it had you know just a few of those prompts or questions that says you know do you are you challenged by this does this happen in your body you know and it was all the signs and symptoms of anxiety and at the very bottom it said you might have anxiety I forget exactly what the wording was but I remember just at that moment that just relief and it actually I can almost feel like my shoulders drop now when I say it it was like for the first time I actually felt seen or I felt heard even though no one was actually listening to me it was to say oh there actually isn't something wrong with me and the way that I experience life others actually feel the same and there was such a tremendous sense of relief in that because as you said you know once you once you have that understanding of what it is you can start to look at things a little bit more objectively sometimes rather than being right in the thick of it and that can make all the difference it really can it really can and isn't it powerful to know that one informational poster on the back of a toilet door can be so <laughs> profound in just the insight it gives you it's um because once you know once you understand it can make sense of it it's it's such a turning point and an opportunity to be able to start to just learn a little bit more about yourself and about how you operate and about all of the different ways that you can manage the 
all the different symptoms because like you like you said the poster asked about physical symptoms about do you experience this because so much of anxiety is physical we th- we we know it's diagnosed as a mental illness but the sensations that come with it are so overwhelmingly physical when we even know how we respond when we're anxious we can detect that it's starting to bubble up then we can put something into place to help it settle down so it doesn't get out of control so it's it's extraordinary that you were able to have a turning point in that moment and just that sense that you're not alone it's a huge part of why I started the podcast which is just letting people know even me who works in this space as a professional and lives with anxiety and has a huge toolkit it's it's a journey and it's really nice to know that other people are on the journey and that there's lots of support as well absolutely for sure and I mean that that poster I'm sure the person who put it up didn't think twice about it but in in effect it it changed my life (sighs) amazing extraordinary and it's it's interesting because there's there are more posters of that nature around domestic violence around alcoholism around gambling and it's a really it's a it's a captive audience when you're putting something on the back of the toilet door (laughs) (laughs) absolutely absolutely how does anxiety meet you these days how how do you experience it um what What are your tools or your go-to mechanisms or strategies, your practices, whatever it might look like or feel like? What are your signs and symptoms, I guess, that you notice it's bubbling up that you see maybe I'm not doing so great today? And then what are your strategies that you tend to put in place? I know you've got a, a whole range of tools in your toolkit, but I'd love you to share a little bit more about what that looks like. Of course. I tend to notice my breathing will change or I'll notice that out of the blue without having if I haven't taken time to tune in with myself which I do much more often uh, over the day now if I haven't been taking time to tune in because I've been really uh, deeply focused on work I'll find that I I start to reach for a deeper breath and even now I'm experiencing a little bit of anxiety and I notice that the first thing that it will affect is my breathing. And I remember as a child saying to my mum, I can't get a full breath. It was like the, the lung capacity could never quite be met. And what I know now is that we, when we become anxious, we start to breathe faster and we can breathe in shallow ways because we're trying to get more oxygen to fuel the fight or fight, the flight or fight response in our body. And so that's one of the first signs for me. And Sometimes I'll sigh as well. I'll just realize as I'm doing things, I'll just go, <sighs> and this is just a, another reset through my, my physiology that I can observe. I can sometimes get really teary. And if, it, if again, I haven't detected my anxiety and I get teary, then I can reflect and go, yes, I can see where this is coming from. And another feeling that I can get sometimes is this sense of raciness that I am I kind of, you know, the the saying all dressed up and nowhere to go. I kind of feel like all wound up and nothing to do. Um, I'm experiencing a lot of the, a lot of the symptoms of anxiety that prepare our body to fight the threat that's been detected or flee, but I might be cooking the dinner or I might be lying in bed. Now these don't happen very often at all now because of the management that I have in place, but they're the ways that I can experience it. And they're the signs to me if I haven't been tuning in that, whoa, I need to do a grounding exercise now. I need to take some breaths or I need to move. I have this overwhelming feeling of running, needing to needing to go out exercise, not running away, but needing to move my body because movement brings all of those changes that have prepared us to fight the threat or or flee. Movement is the natural end to the fight or flight response. So my key strategies that I draw on. And what I'd really love to share is that when I first started, when I first learned and started using these strategies, I had to be more conscious of talking my, and walking myself through the strategy. Now, I've, I've practiced so much through the, the regular use of these strategies that it's like I've built this muscle for calming my system that is much easier to kind of switch on. 
in the same way that you would never ask somebody to do a really complicated yoga pose if they've never done yoga before. You would start small and you would practice daily or regularly. When it comes to a breathing or a grounding strategy, we need to do the same. We need to practice when we're calm, when we're regulated, so that when we are dysregulated, becoming anxious in fight or flight, we can draw on the practice that we've had up until that point. So one of my strategies is absolutely exercise is a huge uh, part of my management. I, I love the way it makes me feel. I love the way it connects me to other people. And I love the way it can just help me manage anxiety in general and enrich my life uh, in other ways. I use a grounding strategy called dropping anchor. And this is a grounding strategy where we recognize that in the midst of a storm, an emotional storm, we can't control what's happening around us, but we can drop our anchor in the middle of it. And there's a beautiful acronym I'll share briefly, which is FACE. And this comes from the work of Dr. Russ Harris, who's an internationally acclaimed author and trainer in acceptance and commitment therapy. F is focus on what you can control. A is acknowledge how you're feeling and what you're thinking. So really build awareness around what it is that's happening for you. C is come back into your body. So I'll notice the con contact between my feet and the floor as I imagine myself sort of dropping anchor. And I'll become mindful about how my body feels in that moment, perhaps what I can hear, what I can see. And E is about engaging in what's important settling our system, grounding, and then moving forward to do what really matters. And another strategy that I will draw on is breathing because breathing uh, activates the vagus nerve and can settle our physiology uh, quite quickly. So they're just some of the tools that I love to use and I have some thinking skills that I use as well. Yeah, wonderful. I love that face and Ross Harris. He's incredible. I've read and watched a lot of his work and, and he, I feel those tools and practices that are really relatable and accessible, you know, that can really meet you where you're at can be game changers. But as you said, they're very, all very well said and done when, you know, you're in the thick of it, but actually to be able to utilize those tools and strategies, you do have to implement them regularly when you're not necessarily in the height of a heightened nervous system and right in that fight or flight space um, so that you can more easily um, access them when you need to in the times that are really challenging. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have any daily rituals or non-negotiables in your life that you draw upon on a daily basis or do they change from one day to the next? They, they change from one day to the next depending on my CrossFit schedule. <laughs> <laughs> so exercise is, is really the integral way that I have managed my anxiety. And what's interesting was that I always exercised when I didn't even know I had anxiety, I was I be at the gym or playing lots of netball. And so I was lucky to have that as a part of my life that had really been role model for me and my family. So exercise is most days, um, but CrossFit, as you, as you would well know, uh, this very, can be very high intensity. Uh, I've been doing it for about three years now. So three times a week is enough. I, I space that out Monday. Wednesday, Friday, I play a basketball game on a Wednesday night and sometimes train with my team on a Sunday when we don't have kids to ferry around everywhere. A really large part of my daily routine is about being aware of where my attention is. And I, I know that when we, we think about mindfulness, we think about being in the present moment, but it's, it's, really important to learn to bring that mindful attention to what we're doing, how we're looking after ourselves and what's happening with our thinking and what's happening with our body during the day. And so I might recognize that I'm feeling a lot of tension because when we're, when we're, we have anxiety, we live with anxiety, our muscles are contracting to prepare us to fight or flee. 
And so there can be extra tension. So I bring mindful awareness to how I feel in myself, where I'm at with my thinking and practice coming back into the present moment on occasions throughout the day. I'm trying to build back up to a daily meditation practice. I'm having some resistance around that. It's not easy. I used to meditate twice a day for 20 minutes. Then I had children and that probably explains it all. Um, so yes, that mindful attention, noticing if I am starting to feel a little anxious, putting a strategy into place and really focusing on what's, what's important for me to do right now because I work for myself. I have a, a, a team that work with me or I say with me, not for me, but there are a lot of demands on my time, conflicting and competing demands. And so I need to be really careful about my priorities. And so when that happens and you can start to feel anxious, then procrastination can sometimes start to kind of seep in. I might go and put on a load of washing or just look around and go, oh, I just need to put the vacuum, you know, the robot vacuum on. So when I, now that I have that mindful awareness of my behaviours, I can recognise what's happening and I can notice it and I can thank my mind for giving me all the sorts of ways to procrastinate and put off what it is that's making me anxious, but also have an awareness that most important thing to do is what I need to do now, which is get this task done, send it off to a client, send it off to my EA, get another podcast episode ready. And then working through that, the anxiety that was bubbling up around the the tasks obviously settles and at the end of the day I've been in the driver's seat and I've been able to bring my anxiety with me not let it stop me not let it get in the way not get rid of it but I've been able to accomplish what it is that's important to me and that's where values come in that's where we know what matters and we can have a mindful awareness of when anxiety is starting to kind of you know get in front um, then we can do something to turn it around I love that and as someone who is a facilitator of mindfulness and meditation specifically that's something that I tend to talk to a lot is that we don't meditate to get better at meditating but we meditate to meet our lives with greater ease you know so how can as you said start to transfer those qualities on, of the practice that we are practicing and even as you mentioned it can be incredibly difficult because our minds love to go off in all the wonderful places that they do. But how can we start to transfer those qualities into the rest of our lives and the quality of attention and awareness that we bring to all aspects? And when we do start to do that, how much we can actually learn about ourselves. And I know in my own journey, it's been, it's been incredible to, to start to facilitate that process because I recognized that my mind was a really wild place to be in. <laughs> <laughs> everybody's is everybody's Abs is <laughs> absolutely absolutely and I I know when I now and I I see it in when I facilitate groups and they say my gosh when the first time that they might meditate it's like my mind I don't know what I've been thinking about or where it's been going like I feel like I'm going crazy and it's like you're not going crazy because you're meditating you're actually just paying attention to that 24 7 radio station that's always there that you're only actually tuning into for the first time which is interesting that's right and uh, I know Russ Harris will say it's, it's often radio doom and gloom mm -hmm. it's focusing on what could go wrong what maybe happened and uh, yes, it's, uh, it's an interesting place when you start to pay attention to what's happening, but that's the first step, isn't it, of course, to be able to make a really positive change. Absolutely. Mm. How do you work with that voice, the, the one that is the radio doom and gloom or is maybe like the inner critic or is full of the shoulds? You know, I, I heard someone, I forget who it was, in a, a book recently was saying we need to stop shudding all over ourselves, which I loved. <laughs> <laughs> How do you work with that? Mm, the way I work with that has completely transformed my life and the lives of many many people who learn these skills that are a really profound way of noticing and observing what you're thinking and then managing 
what you're thinking. When I was doing a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy with my psychologist over many years, over 10 plus years, there were gaps where I'd, I'd be like, see you later. Thank you for absolutely everything. It's hard to say thank you to someone who feels really saved you. Um, and But then I'd stay in touch and I'd be back for various uh, reasons over, over a very long period of time. One of the, the real differences in the way I manage my thinking, which is based in ACT or a behavioural therapy, which is a branch of CBT uh, called acceptance and commitment therapy. A fundamental difference is when, when I was practising and learning CBT, I was taught to look for evidence to dispute my thinking. As, an, as a person with anxiety, uh, we have a lot of future thinking, a lot of catastrophic thinking, and we can also reflect on things that have happened in the past. A classic for me used to be um, I'd be in the car park dropping off the kids and I might wave to a mum who's a friend and I wouldn't get a reply or response, any sort of, you know, uh, visual response. And I would spend the next couple of hours going, now, have I done something wrong? What have I done? How have I wronged this person? Because we can tend to be very um, inwardly focused when these things start to happen. And when I was learning CBT, I was taught to look for the evidence of what would dispute that thinking. Well, I haven't sent an email that was unkind. I haven't missed a catch up. I haven't, you know, wronged this person in any way that I can see. So therefore there's the evidence that there's no reason that this person should be upset with me. However, I found that to be exhausting and really difficult. I was able to do it under a lot of occasions but it would depend on the intensity of the anxiety. As a new mum with a young child, I had overwhelming anxiety about his health and those skills were not useful when I would see a lump or a bump or a rash and my mind would go to the idea of perhaps him having a terminal illness and I couldn't use these skills, it just, I just couldn't draw on them. And so I'd be, again, seeking reassurance by going back to the GP. When I learned the skills I'm about to share with you, once I started training in acceptance and commitment therapy, it's completely different. So one of the things that we we learn first is to observe our thinking, which is of course of uh, what we can learn to do through mindfulness and meditation. And we can think of our thoughts passing by as traffic. We can observe them. We can observe the traffic flow, different cars, different thoughts, just moving through but every now and again we essentially hop into one hop into one of the cars and head off down the road and that's when our attention has been captured we're lost in thought and we're often hooked by really painful thought so when it comes to the approach I use the first step is to practice that observation to develop that mindful awareness that there is a part of us can watch ourselves having our thoughts and and we can we can use a strategy which is called diffusion, which puts distance between us and what we're thinking. And it takes practice. And of course, this is just a slight overview for general information, but even just to be able to say, I'm having the thought that my friend at school is upset with me. It's a way of saying to yourself, oh, I'm having a thought. Here comes another one just like the other one, because that's what happens. We can further add to that prefix. I notice I'm having the thought that my friend at school is upset with me and we're getting a little bit of distance and it starts to take the sting out of living in that thought and really um, looking from that thought and living with it and really being hooked by it. The next step that we can ask ourselves is once we've noticed we're having a thought, we can ask ourselves, is it helpful? And the answer is usually no, it's not helpful. And so then we can say, well, what would be helpful right now? And that's to re-engage in what's important. So the way that I apply this now is I've practiced it so much, it's, it's an ingrained thinking skill. So when I observe a difficult thought, all I have to ask myself is, is it helpful? 
I immediately answer no. And then I engage back in what I was doing and bring my attention back into the present and focus on what, what I was doing before that thought captured my attention. And it, it was the only way I was able to move on from the external reassurance of asking my mum, asking my husband, talking to my doctor. I can now, I now have a very good understanding that thoughts are not facts necessarily. Sometimes they are true. It doesn't matter if they're true. It's are they helpful? We know that they're not instructions. They're not commands. It's like a passing parade. And so when we can observe them, we can put distance between us and what we're thinking. We can ask ourselves the question about how helpful they are. Then we know what to do next. So that has been a really life-changing learning for me. But there's always that knowing, doing gap. It's one thing to know and to be developing skills. It's another thing to put them into practice. And you would know that uh, very clearly through all of your facilitation uh, with and all of your practice, of course, in mindfulness and meditation as well. Yeah, I feel that's a wonderful tool or practice to share. I love that idea of really tuning in to see firstly creating the distance but then actually asking is it helpful you know and that how we can start to reflect on that and we become as we do things more and more often more aware of those habitual patterns or ways of thinking and thinking you know how often do I spend wasting time or energy or focus on things that really are not helpful in my life (laughs) and what would life be like if I was actually to just to choose differently and that's the thing that with that awareness, we, we gain choice, which is incredible to think about because when you are challenged by anxiety, you can feel so stuck sometimes and you feel like this is the only way of being. But there is, may we may not be able to, as you said, with that the anchor drop, it's like the storm that's around us, we might not be able to control or have any ability to influence, but we always do have that ability to influence how we need it. So yes. I love that. Yes. Thank you for sharing. For sure. You mentioned there about how, especially with the NCBT, how you were finding that maybe those tools weren't as helpful for you as a young mom and that that, I guess, brought up a lot for you in terms of your own anxiety and your journey with mental challenges. And how now you have translated that into the work that you do, which is such important work helping parents and teachers and children to understand anxiety to change the relationship with it to dial it down what are you noticing are the main challenges faced with all of the above I guess and are they similar are they very different and over the last few years or or even you know throughout the course of all the work that you've been doing is it the same kind of catch cries that you're hearing or have things changed a lot of in the past I guess two or so years with all that's gone on <laughs> yes yes there there is a lot that's changed and fundamentally because anxiety is the way the brain and the body respond in anticipation of a threat we've really been faced with so much uncertainty which drives anxiety as well with with COVID and it certainly had an impact on children and on families and on schools in a way that we could, you know, we, we could never have anticipated at the beginning when it all sort of started way back in early 2020. A, a lot of what I'm seeing in the work that I'm doing with schools is that there are a lot of children who whose mental health if they had a pre-existing mental health challenge prior to COVID, it was really exacerbated in in lockdowns and with the threat of uh, potentially becoming sick themselves or family members becoming sick and all of the the, uh, ensuing challenges and worries that accompany the coronavirus pandemic here. Those children are, uh, you know, the the, the threat in, a, in many ways is passing in that we're much more able to uh, predict our day. We're more certain about our uh, likelihood of becoming very sick. We sort of have that certainty around, well, I've, I'm vaccinated. Most people who are fit and well are actually okay with COVID. And so the unpredictability is, is settling down. 
and the routine that children and families are getting back into is helping a lot. So there's a lot of really great things that are happening. And some people who are having really difficult challenges with their mental health are improving. But there are a lot who, those the challenges that they were facing in COVID are really coming with them now into 2022. And one of the other things too that we know about our mental health and about our general well-being is that the ability to connect with other people is extremely powerful when it comes to helping us regulate our own nervous system and co-regulation with another person uh, such as yourself. Like you you have a, a beautiful, calm nature about you, the way that you speak, uh, the tone of your voice. And, and so being here with you is calming for me. One of the things that some people are finding, particularly children, is that reconnecting with and really finding their feet in their friendship groups is trickier after being disconnected for so long, particularly connecting over uh, Xbox or PlayStation for for some has become a default kind of comfortable way of connecting with friends. And you'll find groups of friends who could get on their bikes and head down to the local jumps will be individually in their homes, hanging out, but online. Other challenges for people are about change and about, well, what did, for adults, for example, what did, what did COVID help me think about? So how did COVID help me think about where I am in my own life and what it is that I want to do differently? A lot of staff are leaving their jobs, as we know, the great resignation, because there's this awareness that uh, I, I can do something different now. There's more opportunity for me or what I was doing does not fit with the lifestyle that I want for myself moving forward. So what we know about the statistics is among children and adolescents or among adolescents in particular globally, there's been a doubling in anxiety and depression. I'm really waiting on the stats that we've seen in the past from Beyond Blue, for example, who prior to COVID would tell us that one in three women and one in five men in a 12 month period will experience, uh, sorry, in a lifetime will experience an anxiety challenge. Uh, Whereas when those statistics are republished with newer data, we'll have a like for like comparison. At the moment, those of us in the space have some like for like comparisons. Others, you know, other times we're looking at pre COVID stats and post COVID stats that are not done by the same groups. Overall, there is a a change and increase and increased challenge when it comes to anxiety and mental health. And it's a struggle for a lot of families and it's an overwhelming challenge for many, many schools. So it's it's hard to see. And I I spoke with two schools yesterday and... uh, it's fulfilling to be able to go in and really support school communities. Uh, it's it's also, you know, I'm, I'm a parent too, you know, and I, I know what it's like to parent an anxious child. I know what we went through in COVID. I know how it impacted me and the mental health of my children. And so I know that it's a, it's a journey a lot of families are going through that's hard, but I also really like to let people know that it's, there's so much that we can do to support our kids and ourselves. Um, and it's really about recognising the need for help and connecting with the, the services and the supports that are, are available, even if there is a little wait, because the services are quite uh, busy at the moment. Mm. It's interesting hearing you say, especially around children with that element of social connection. And I know in my own experience, having grown up as an anxious child and all the way through that, social connection was never something that was ever thought about you know even as an adult for me it's not something that really I paid too much attention to until it was really taken away and as someone who generally would be quite introverted at the beginning thought to myself this is my dream you know to be (laughs) (laughs) I don't have to face the world at all I can just live from the safety of my own home and you know all will be well but actually recognizing that over time that lack of social connection how it doesn't need to be in massive groups it actually is as you mentioned just that notion of even one-to-one meaningful connection you know that 
is so so important because for so many reasons you know as we were always hardwired to do to be you know together in tribes and all of that firstly but also then from a sense of mental health and moving through because of that you you have the conversations that you say hey oh I'm not the only one who maybe feels like that or you feel that way too or you know even for that ability to just support each other which which hasn't been the case and how people are and I'm noticing it myself with people who I'm working with they're they are struggling that notion of going back to life as normal was great in theory but now as people you know things are opening up and people are quite anxious about getting out and about and feeling social um and how you mentioned that even kids now are defaulting to playing the, the xbox or the playstation from their rooms where it's nearly this uh, a misguided sense of connection and even through zoom and things like that which we had probably you know over the course of the pandemic but it doesn't actually match the face-to-face -face social connections that is really true and fulfilling um, and that really does make all the difference but it is great to hear and I think for me it's it's reassuring to hear that as you said the awareness of the problem is something that is the first step and even hearing how schools are coming to you and having these conversations and they're recognizing that things aren't as they maybe once were and that there are people who are challenged you know that the statistics whether they are actually things that are read and understood or they're more of a felt sense of the people who are around me are not coping mm -hmm. how do we start to make those changes so hopefully with wonderful people like yourself out in the world doing great things that we can start to move forward and move things in a, a more positive direction so people do feel seen and heard and supported yes. um, because that's when real change can happen for the better for sure yes yeah mm. well I would love to sit here and chat all day I feel I have so much more I would love to pick your brain about. Um, it has been such a wonderful chat, but would love to share with anyone who might be listening if they're not aware of you before now and they would love to dive in a little more and discover more about you and the work that you do. How can they find you? Oh, thank you. Well, thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me to be a part of your campaign. It's just such a joy to be part of a campaign that's raising awareness and really supporting people uh, with their mental health. So um, so thank you very much for that. And, and if people would like to, uh, to have a look at the work that I'm doing and uh, read some blogs or listen to some podcasts, really, I guess the first place to go is to my website, which is drjodyrichardson.com. And that's Jody with an I, but please join me on Instagram. And uh, the podcast is a weekly podcast as well. So uh, it's a, I have the joy of uh, doing what you're doing today, meeting new people and, and learning from them and sharing that with my community. So um, that's obviously available as well. Wonderful. Thank you. And I, before we go, do you have an ask? Is there something that we can, as a community, help you with in any way? Oh, gosh, that's such a lovely question. I've never been asked that before. Um, well, you know, I guess the thing is, um, with, with the podcast, it's been a real journey for me to overcome, not overcome, bring my anxiety with me, I guess is the best way to put it. Uh, it's been the way that I really wanted to support the wider community and a, and a global community, as it turns out, with anxiety support, really uh, interesting people to listen to and learn from and digestible, relatable information that helps people feel like they they can put things into place that are going to help them and their families. And um, if listeners or people who are viewing this would uh, like to tune in and if you enjoy it, share it with one person would be really amazing because it's something that I invest in uh, to produce uh, as a gift to the community and uh, it would be really amazing to see it spread far and wide so that everyone who needs that help can have access to it. Wonderful thank you and last but not least if you have one piece of advice or guidance for anyone who might be struggling out there at the moment to to help them take back their own mind what would you say to them? I would say that it's 
important to remember that it is not natural to feel happy all of the time. And that when we don't feel good, which is often because we're human, we can often look for ways to push our feelings aside and find ways to feel better in the moment. When we know that it's not natural to be happy all the time and that when we're not happy, we can develop an openness and an acceptance, not that you have to like not being not feeling good, but just an acceptance that this is a part of life and that it will pass and you'll move through those challenging times often more quickly and with more ease and you'll have a renewed appreciation for the times when you are feeling more content, more peaceful, more joyful. Um, so that would be my advice. And understanding that it's not natural to be happy all the time, I think is a really liberating thing to remember. Beautiful. Absolutely. Wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jody, for being a part of Take Back Your Mind. I look forward to chatting with you again very, very soon. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure talking with you.